Because whose birthday is it? Mine. <gasps> Let's go have a look. Whoa. Whoa. Aren't you lucky? So I'm Marie and this is Mel and we've been together 13 years um, and yeah we've got two beautiful children Stella who turns five today and Jimmy who is two. Bush. Here we go. And this one. So I work in childcare and Mel is a nurse working in disability support so yeah that's us. I don't know what you want. Okay. Right now life is good for Brisbane couple Marie and Mel. So looking after the kids is pretty 50-50 with us. I have been talking to a few of my friends about how things are split up with, with them and it has been a big, I think, got them thinking. All right, you want your pancakes? Okay. I think both being mothers, we do share the mental load big time. Yeah. We get breakfast ready. One of us will usually be helping the kids with breakfast while the other is doing, you know, lunch for Stella at school. I do think from, from what I've seen and, and obviously working in childcare as well, you know, I do see a lot of families. If children need to go home sick, it is often the mother. So in our house, we do try to tag team caring for the kids when they're sick. So once it's been one person, you know, one particular illness, we do swap over um, the next time round. <laughs> We've both got careers that are equally important. You know, we don't want to be letting down our employers by always, you know, one person always sort of having to take time off. For this couple, division of labour in the house is not about traditional assumptions of who does what, it's about what makes sense. It's a clean slate. Like, when we first moved out together, it was... I suppose we just sort of worked out what we liked and didn't like and, and built on from there. It definitely does, you know, make for a more harmonious relationship. Um, not that we're perfect in any way, shape or form. No. I want to make that clear as well. We have our moments, but um, yeah, I think we're both quite conscious of making sure that things are fairly evenly split. It's a model they hope Stella and Jimmy will absorb. Well, I think they're growing up and seeing a fairly equal partnership. We need strong girls. And we also need strong boys who respect strong girls. So yeah, I guess that's what we're trying to, you know. Embrace. Yeah, um, and raise them to be. Ah! Yeah, and again. Most research on the division of housework looks at opposite sex couples, and it's fair to say it's a very different story to Marie and Mel's. Who does what is still largely trapped in the past. Exclusive new data from the Australian Institute of Family Studies shows that almost half of all household tasks are always or usually done by the female compared to 10% by the male. When you add children, that jumps to up to 60% for women. And even when both partners are working full time, nearly a third of females still carry the bulk of the domestic load. Break down and let it all out. Break down and let it all out. Women have changed the way that they live their lives hugely in the last half a century. What they haven't done is move out of their domestic roles, essentially. I mean, everybody knows um, families where that's not the case, right? Um, but the big patterns are undeniable. Women moved into the workforce and just took on that extra work in addition to the domestic workload they already have. Is there any research yet on same-sex couples and when you remove gender from the equation, what happens to the balance of work? Yeah, there is. And it's pretty clear that same-sex couples do have a more egalitarian distribution of work than heterosexual um, couples on the domestic front. That's not to say that same-sex couples are all 50-50 division of labour. And actually, the goal here isn't 50-50 division of labour. In lots of relationships, it makes sense for one person to take on more of the breadwinning and the other person to take more of the homemaking work. The issue is that gender is decisive in lots of families in determining um, who takes on more of the domestic workload above and beyond any question of you know, who's the primary breadwinner. 
When it comes to the work and home juggle, it's often still assumed that women will take the lead, particularly when it comes to children. And I think for working women, the problem is that you feel sometimes that you have to do your job as if you don't have a family, but then also be a mother like you don't have a job. There are more than two and a half million carers in Australia, and more than half of them are female. That rises to almost three quarters when you take only primary carers. When it comes to more informal care, such as raising children, women spend nearly twice as many hours a week doing unpaid care work as men. It takes up almost two thirds of a woman's weekly working time, but only just over a third of a man's. That means on average, for every hour an Australian man does unpaid caring, an Australian woman does an hour and 48 minutes. Sometimes I feel like when I turn up at work, I've already done a full day's work uh, with the kids, you know, getting them dressed and fed and ready for school and dropped at school and trying to get myself ready. Um, and you turn up to work and start another whole day and then you go back home and do it all again. Emma Falou is a mother of three who combines that with running the Equality Institute, an organisation working to advance gender equality and end violence against women and girls. The reason I started the Equality Institute um, was because I needed a way to support my children, do the work that I cared about, but in a way that was balanced and, um, and created enough space for those roles. So. I think it's sad that I had to start a whole organisation just to find that balance. Of course, many good men do do their fair share, but in the same way there are assumptions about women's roles, men face barriers too, based on traditional stereotypes. We've seen that, you know, there's certainly evidence that men want to play a stronger role in caring responsibilities, but unfortunately policies and practices haven't caught up yet, and we're not seeing that really play out on the ground. So women are still carrying the, the burden um, by far. There are lots of workplaces where men instinctively know that they are not supposed to take that course. They look around and they don't see other men taking um, personal leave or they look around and they don't see other men taking flexible work or parental leave. And so they think, mm, I know that that is not supposed to be for me. The assumptions about men's and women's roles at home have massive ramifications for workplaces. Anecdotally, when I um, talk to women, people often talk about being offered a promotion at work and deciding they're not going to take it because how they feel is, I've barely got my head above water right now, why yep. would I take on any more responsibility? I think um, we've spent so much time and money looking at how women behave at work and, oh, why aren't women putting up their hands for promotions or, you know, um, asking for more money or more responsibilities and so on. Um, and you can't really make sense of that behaviour <laughs> until you understand what's happening to that woman outside working hours. We already know that COVID is adding disproportionately to women's burdens outside the workplace. For example, they've picked up most of the responsibility for homeschooling, meaning the pandemic has set back some of the progress that's been made towards gender equality. What I find I found quite disheartening um, through all the research through COVID is that women, even though we were working from home for those industries that could, were still picking up that additional workload, even though we had more men at home. Something very familiar to many women is mental load, the invisible organising, planning and remembering that takes up so much of day-to-day -day life. How exhausting is that for women? Well, you, it's constantly on your mind. It's like you, you can sit there and you can think about your kids, you can think about running a household. Um, you know, for me, I've been quite fortunate because my husband is a stay-at-home dad and it's almost like you need a personal assistant at home a clone, actually, because otherwise you'd have to explain everything to them, to actually help you run all, all of the other logistics that are incredibly important. A clone. You've a clone. nailed it. <laughs> we don't need to do any further interviews. <laughs> Clones is what is required. We have got the answer. <laughs> a huge part of the domestic workload around children is done outside the home. It is remembering things. It is um, remembering that one of your kids is having a kid come over for a play date and that kid um, is allergic to nuts. It's all of these, you know, 
cloud of mosquitoes of tiny responsibilities that we know women have running through their heads even when they're at work in a way that doesn't happen to the same degree among men. I just remembered that I forgot to text the babysitter that there's no margarine in the fridge for the kids' lunches tomorrow. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've got to be careful here that we're not just looking at women who are parents um, because caring responsibilities are um, commonly about children but also they are about um, caring for unwell relatives, um, aged parents and so on. It still falls disproportionately on women. That's right, yeah. My name is Ashna Devaki Thapa. I'm 22 years old and I was born in Nepal and I'm living in Tasmania for seven years now. I'm caring for my grandma, my mom, and my dad, basically, and my little sister. <laughs> Debaki came to Australia in 2014 as a refugee, and she's carried more on her shoulders than most young women. My dad had a liver cancer in 2016. Since then, he's not really well and language barrier as well. Plus my mom has a many chronic illness, many, many, many chronic illness. And for my grandma, she has a bladder cancer, heart problem, and many other oh health God. problems. Hi, darling. Hi. How was your day? Plus my little sister, you she's young, no. and my you parents can't look after her. I have to look after all the finance of my parents, mom, and my sisters. For grandma, I have to take her to all the appointments. I have to miss my work, miss my personal life, just to take her to the appointments and the doctors and hospitals. Thinking about my future, thinking about my little sister's future is really hard. Sometimes I feel like I'm depressed. On top of being an unpaid carer, Debaki also works full-time as a bicultural and disability worker, making it tough to find time for herself. I don't have my personal life or social life. I rarely go out with my friends. To be honest, I don't have any friends because of my caring role. After COVID, I feel like I can't go out much. I don't want to get a COVID from my work, so I am limiting my working hours and spending more time with my parents. She says in Nepalese culture, there's an additional layer of expectation for women when it comes to caring for family. In my community, they don't even have any idea what is care mean. They don't even have any idea. They think it's our duty to look after our parents. So it's our duty actually rather than a care role. Women are the one who is running home. I want to be in equal level as my brother or any of the male. Despite her heavy load, Debaki doesn't complain. I love to have my parents, yes. <laughs> it is a big job, but, but especially being in a different country because my parents doesn't have any language, so it would be very hard to survive on their own, so I have to help them. Does the government measure all the important aspects of our economy and society, chiefly unpaid domestic labour? I think it's a fascinating question because I think our community in our society and increasingly our economy relies so heavily on so much unpaid work, predominantly by women. And I don't think we do understand that and pack that into our discussion about how the budgets work and where we need to actually acknowledge what that heavy lifting of unpaid work is doing and how you might respond to that with the right kinds of investments in things like childcare and superannuation on paid parental leave. And for women like Debaki, who are carrying a particularly heavy care load, Ming Long says the post-COVID era is a chance to reimagine the work-home balance. The crisis always presents an opportunity for us to have a really hard conversation with ourselves as a nation to understand what do we want to be in a post-COVID, you know, fifth industrial revolution. This is the moment to actually take what's happened to us, because we could not control that, and actually make the big leap ahead.
Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.